Good morning. And welcome to worship this morning. We're so glad you joined us for worship on this beautiful sunny morning. Uh, just a couple of brief announcements to remind you. We're having our Wednesday programming now. Uh, the dinners at 5.30 and followed by children's uh, activities and, and lessons here in the, in the uh, fellowship hall. And then the adults are going over into the uh, lounge to look at this book and talk about this book. It's called The Third Day, and I got some books that came in, <laughs> finally. So those of you who are part of that have been waiting for books, I have four of them. Uh, so if you want to get one today, pick it up and, you know, you can have it for Wednesday. Um, this is being led by Reverend Bruce Fenner, and then it'll be taken over in March by Kent. Uh, will be, Ingram will be leading it then. So I did get those in finally. So you're invited to that. The dinners for whoever would like to show up. It's kind of helpful if you let us know you're coming. If you haven't come before, it just gives us a chance to figure out numbers a little bit. So I, I, I like to look at the menu myself beforehand and anticipation. <laughs> so this week we're going to have tacos with fixins, rice, and fresh fruit. So there you go. I can bring some hot sauce. So I invite you to come. It's a wonderful time. The discussion has been really good. Folks have really enjoyed it uh, as we talk about issues related uh, to this study. And then uh, starting this Wednesday, so this first Wednesday of Lent, we will be having our soup luncheon. Now we've been doing that for years. That is starts at 1130 uh, and it features homemade soups and, and then sometimes homemade bread or bread and other things with that. Uh, and we invite you to come to that. And then uh, there's a short program that goes with it, but it's not very long. So we run from 11.30 to 1, and that starts Wednesday. That will continue on throughout until uh, Wednesday, March 27th, which is when we're getting very close to Easter. So that's another opportunity for you during Lent. So there's two. You, could, you, know, you can come to the luncheon, and you can come back for supper, too, if you'd like. We'd be glad to have you. I'm going to be there. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, Wednesdays is going to be a day of church during this season of Lent. We invite you to that. Um, other announcements, I would just have you take a look in the bulletin and kind of keep track of that. And then before we start, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, something new this year. If you look to our cross, you'll see on top of there a crown of thorns. Now, it's good size, so I know you can see it. And I want to tell you something about that crown of thorns. So first, there's a passage of scripture. And when they, this is from Matthew 27, 29, and when they had uh, planted a crown of thrones, uh, thorns, <laughs> they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. This is referring to Jesus. Now this particular one comes with a, a certificate that indicates uh, this is from th uh, thorn bur uh, bushes that grow abundantly in the Jerusalem environment. The monks of St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai are uh, pointing out a, a thorn bush grown east of the large monastery wall, which means where they think that these, the thorns that were made into Christ's crown could come from. This particular crown comes from there, and it, it was sanctified in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. So if you know what that is, that's a church that was built upon the place where they believe Jesus was laid to rest. And this crown was provided by Rose Anderson for the church as a gift, and we thank you, Rose, for that. So it adds to our, our, our season. Uh, I hope that you'll look upon that throne. And then, you know, if you want to come up and touch it, be aware I've stuck myself two or three times with the thorns. So they're real. Uh, but if you want to see it closer, you're certainly welcome to do so. All right, I have to get my... this goes on. All right, I'm going to invite you to join with me in the call to worship. Now, this is an affirmation taken from 1 Timothy in various verses. I have a reading that begins, and then we all read together as indicated on the slide. So it begins, there is one God, and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all to whom we testify. And if you'll join with me, the saying is sure
So join with me, if you would, please, in our hymns of praise. The words will be up front, but there is the place in the hymnals. Morning, Ava. How are you today? That's good. 
It's nice out today, huh? It was cold yesterday, but it's nice today. All right, so we're in this time of Lent where we talk about the time Jesus got crucified for our sins. So today, we talk about seeking attention. You know, sometimes we work really hard to try to get people's attention or approval. We put things online for everyone to see. We base our importance on who notices us. The people who seem to make it are those who are popular and get like the most likes. After all, we watch people on YouTube or Facebook and boost their platforms. We want to be the most important. We elevate our live, own lives and want other people to tell us how great we are. But sometimes we forget what we should truly be first and foremost. Jesus warns us about this. In the Bible, he told a story about people who try to seek that attention for themselves. He explained that those who try to get themselves into a special place of honor will probably be pushed back to lesser. In those days, where you sat at the table was quite important. Jesus was explaining that if we try to think too much of ourselves, sometimes it backfires. We cannot earn our own excess in the long run. Jesus advised people to take a lesser spot. If we are thinking less of ourselves and aiming to serve God, we let other people go first. We don't try to do things for applause or attention, but we do them for the Lord. Jesus also warned that if you're inviting people to something, you shouldn't just invite them because they can give you something in return. Whether it's a positive behavior or things we can do or even our prayers, it's important to recognize that we don't earn God's love by what we do. In this world, love seems to come with attention or popularity. This isn't how God sees it. We don't do things to get something back. We don't do things for others to like us or congratulate us. We should realize that nothing is our own. God enables us and strengthens us. All we have, all we have comes from him. And we want to remember that resilience or reliance. Don't think too much of yourself. God comes first. Why don't we say a prayer real quick to ask God for the humility and perspective. Dear God, thank you for giving us honor and blessing. Help us to not think too highly of ourselves, but to keep our hearts fixed on you. Thank you for your love. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. Our reading today comes from Luke, chapter 14, verses 7 to 14, New Revised Standard Version. Humility and hospitality. When he noticed how the guests chose their, the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor. In case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host, and the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place, and then in disgrace you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you would be honored in the presence of all who sat at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He also said to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers and sisters or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The word of God. So imagine you invited Jesus over to supper. That'd be great, wouldn't it? 
and you've invited a certain number of people, and of course you have Jesus, an honored guest, you've invited other people who you felt, you know, would appreciate that and would appreciate you having invited them. And so you've set up this nice table, and in the ancient world, as is common today, they would practice what's called a symposium, which just means a nice meal followed by conversation. So you got it all set up, you've, you've made it really nice, and in comes Jesus, and he's standing there, and he's sort of watching what's happening, you know, going on around, seeing who's doing what. And he notices that there are people who are obviously of a higher status in society, and in those days, everybody knew who was who. And you notice they start kind of vying for the position next to the host. Now, the, the honored positions for the host was on the host right and on the host left. So they're kind of hanging around there. Maybe, you know, have you ever seen people when they want to save a chair, they tip it against the table? I can kind of envision, you know, trying to mark out the area of what they want. And he's watching all that. And of course, you, you, you see him as an honored guest, but what does he do? He speaks up and he says, you know what? When you come to something like this, Rather than try to take the first place, the, you know, the honored place, and run the risk that somebody will come in that maybe has more status than you, and then you will have to move because by that time, everybody's got their seats and take the lowest place at the temple, or at the table, excuse me, and thus be humbled or humiliated, as we like to say. Better to do that and then have the host see you and say, no, no, friend, Come, come, sit here, sit higher on the table. Because status was a big thing around the table in those days. It really was. These symposiums were the kind of activity that you would want to get invited to because it meant you were somebody. But even amongst these people who were honored guests, undoubtedly, Jesus was a very popular rabbi and somewhat controversial character by this time, so people wanted to see him. This was an interesting thing to have happen. And what was he trying to teach them? Well, we talk about a humbled heart. But I think Jesus was making a commentary that went much more deep than just the need to be humble. Because that's easy to say. Well, we need to be humble, right? We need to wait our time in line. We need to be, you know, polite and let people go before us. I was raised to hold doors open for ladies and older people. And now that I'm an older person, it's really strange that people hold it open for me. <laughs> but I was raised to do that. It was only the courteous thing to do because they had a status. They had a status in society. We treated ladies like ladies and we treated older people with the dignity and respect they were entitled to owing to their age. Now. You know, so this was just something that I understood, but it was not about having it, holding the door open for them and doing this or showing them that so they could say, well, aren't you a polite young man? It was just simply the right thing to do. So I think Jesus is talking about a little bit more about this concept that we sometimes have when we think of what it means to be humble. I think he was talking about status. Now, status is a whole different thing than humi humility. Status is a sense of something you possessed, but you don't own it. Your status you don't own, and if you think you do, you can very easily be shown you don't, because there's always somebody looking to humble somebody of status. But status is something that society puts upon you. Without society recognizing you as someone important, you would be no different than anyone else. You might think yourselves to be greater than how you're being treated, but it is, in fact, how others see you that determines your status. Now, these people felt that they owned their status. They were, after all, probably prominent people in the community. Maybe a Sadducee or a Pharisee of some note possessing perhaps great property and money, probably dressed very nicely because they tended to. So that's the thing about status. If you really think a lot about it, you really want to fit the role that you have in your mind of who you are. 
your personal stats. And it's interesting how we do that in our society, but it, what we see, if we look at uh, the, the cultures of the world as they have developed over the long history of humanity, almost every culture has some aspect of status in how it treats its population. You go back to the time of royalty. In England, for example, if you were of the royal family, you were born into the royal family. Didn't matter what the people thought. You had birthright. That's one form of status, and that is how organization uh, took place in some of these more feudal type nations or nations that have had royalty, kings and queens. Their status, they believed, was a birthright. And as long as the people agreed with it, that's how they were organized, they had that status. So if the king walked or the queen walked in the room, you got up. And you didn't sit down to the royal majesty, sat. They had that kind of status. You didn't sit next to them up front unless you were a son or a daughter or someone extremely important. The status they had by birth was in for that person as well. That's one way to organize society. Other societies organized around power. What gave you status? You had an army behind you. That's more like Rome. Rome also had an emperor and things, but prior to that, it really was who commanded the greatest respect of the largest army behind them that had the greatest status. That's what the grass crown was about. They crowned them with the grass crown, which was the greatest status you could receive as a general. Power. Power is another form of status. And of course, there's always money. Money can give you a lot of status. And there's other things too, you know, education sometimes, position, what role you play in society, what people call you, the titles you have. All these things are aspects of status. Many years ago, it was my job to organize luncheons, like, you know, uh, for education purposes, but really to raise money. It was all about raising money. And it really had a lot to do with status. So my intention was is to get the most important person I could that people would be impressed by to speak. And why? Because they would want to be there. You see, that's the thing about status. By being close to someone with status, somehow you feel your status goes up. You know, they, you were able to bring in so-and-so, or you were able to have lunch with them, or you were able to have a conversation with them. And, and that impressed people. And then if you really wanted the best table or seat in the house, you had to pay the most money. Then I put you right up front where you were going to interact with that person. That's a kind of status. That's the kind of status that goes with being recognized as someone that someone would want to talk to, be close to, interact with, be able to, you know, mingle, which is a big part of business in that kind of business I was in, is connecting people together of high status, because people with high status like to be with people with high status. That's a kind of status. So Jesus is looking at this group of people who had that kind of attitude, and he's saying to them, you know, you really don't want that seat up there because maybe someone in here has higher status than you. Now, who was Jesus? Philippians 3.16 tells us, he did not see divinity, divinity as something to be grasped, but emptied himself of all that he possessed to enter into the world. In other words, he humbled himself he had to humble himself to walk among us, to become human. He had to humble himself. Who was the one in the greatest status in that room that day? Who's the one that deserved to be at the front of the table? We know who that is. But that isn't, he didn't say that, did he? He didn't say, hey, that's my spot up there. What do you think you're going to go sit there for? That's my spot. No, he would have taken the least exalted seat at the table. And people would have recognized who he was. 
There's several instances in Jesus' life where he makes this same point. Often he will talk about this. He who would be first must be last. You must be the servant of your brother or sister if you were to be, you know, first in the kingdom, that kind of thing. He, he talked about that all the time. Somebody with that kind of status, that kind of position in the world is the one who could speak about that. So if you were the host that night, and you've invited Jesus to dinner, and he said all this, you might be thinking, watching to see what people do. People maybe moved around a little. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they just, you know, thought, come on. You know that's not how it works in society. But I wonder about the host, because it might be a little bit embarrassing you see, we tend to think of Jesus as always being this fellow who's just loving and loves everybody, which he did, of course. But we never think of him as having a judgmental bone in his body. He wouldn't say anything mean to anybody. Well, if you believe that, you haven't read the scriptures very closely. Jesus spoke sometimes in a very, what we might think, rude manner. It is a little rude, isn't it, to criticize the host that invites you to dinner? Because the host would have felt criticized as well, because a lot of times the seating was prearranged. You know, a little, not necessarily so much the little name card like I've seen on tables telling you where to sit, but people knew where they were supposed to go. There was a sense of who was higher in the status than I. But then he speaks to the, the householder himself. Uh-oh. <laughs> you always should say, uh-oh, when something like that happens in your mind. Because that means something good isn't coming, at least, uh, as far as Jesus. And so Jesus says to the person who put on this dinner and invited all these likely very important people to this symposium where there would be learned learned, you know, learned conversation at the end of it and people would talk about the politics of the day and you know talk about their lives and you know it sounds a little bit like Wednesday morning when you have breakfast doesn't it and they were anticipating a nice dinner or luncheon as it happened to be and he says when you hold one of these don't invite these sorts of people your friends your family Wealthy people who can easily invite you back. In other words, to raise your status in society, don't be first thinking about how this will do good for you. That's not what should first be on your mind. What first should be on your mind is bringing people together that need to be together, that need each other, need relationships. So he talks about a banquet. Now, banquets were a bigger deal. Those weren't symposiums. These were big deals. And banquets were the talk of the town. Everybody wanted to go to the banquet. But there was a little problem with that. In those days, you didn't invite people who were blind. You didn't invite people who were crippled. You didn't invite people who had any kind of birth defect or problem with their skin, discoloration. You didn't invite people that were old, you didn't invite people who could not raise your status, but would only, in their eyes, bring your status down. They didn't do it. They weren't allowed in synagogue often. They surely were not allowed in the temple. They were banned from the temple, at least the inner parts of the temple. He says, if you're going to have a meal like that, invite them. Bring them into your midst. In other words, status is not necessarily all it's cracked up to be. It's not necessarily what we should be striving for, getting that place higher at the table, no matter how nice it is. One thing I discovered about being at the higher table during banquets, because every once in a while I get to do that, you get served food first. That's a plus. But is that worth somebody else getting their food last and cold? Jesus didn't think so. So he says, invite these people. Now, I, you know, I don't usually use a lot of illustrations I read in books. I used to. 
30 years ago, but, but this one got me. And so I got it. This is one I read in a book. It's an illustration. So this passage of scripture concerning the luncheons and the banquets, you know, in Luke, it was the subject of a Sunday school lesson one Sunday morning. Kids had heard about that. You need to invite the poor, the needy, the people that can't necessarily pay you back with additional status by being present with you. Invite people, other people too, mix it up. Anyway, and so it, they had learned about that and, and you know, little kids actually listen. <laughs> I found that out too, you know, they do listen to what you say in places like Sunday school rooms. So we need to be thoughtful of that and careful. But so church starts up, little boys in the, you know, out with the parents sitting out there and the pastor's getting up and he's saying an announcement. He says, oh, by the way, don't forget the luncheon coming up. It's on whatever day, the luncheon coming up and be sure to invite your family and friends. We didn't think any of it. The little boy raised his hand. Now, I've never seen anybody raise their hand except to give a prayer request out in the congregation, but the little boy raises his hand. And of course, you know, that just, oh, pastors love that stuff because it's fun. The kids are so wonderful to see and he's excited, thinks he's going to say something really cute. And he says, you know, okay, son, what, what, what do you want to say? And he says, we're not supposed to invite those folks. <laughs> now, that would be funny. True story, I guess. They claim, but then I, they always tell me those stories are true, but... I could see that happening. Little children hear these things and they don't try to make, a, you know, reasons why. Because little children aren't concerned with status. Did you know that? They learn to wait in line. They're taught to open the door for their elders and a little boy, maybe for ladies. And why? Because it is the right thing to do. Not because it'll get you thanks or applause from your parents. I don't ever remember that, you know, a couple pats on the head, you know. We do what is right because we are people who believe in the love and the grace of God, who has taught us that everyone we meet is entitled to dignity, is entitled to being treated with dignity and with, with honor. Just as Jesus stood there that day and looked upon all these people with so much honor in their lives, probably, and he taught them about a lesson that every little child knew. It isn't all about you. Now, I'm not talking about little children in your home if you raise them, because when they're real little, it is all about them. I'm well aware of that. I'm talking about the small child that gets out in the public and starts to learn the world, and it takes a little while for them to realize that society tells them it is all about them. And so suddenly, doors aren't held open anymore. Chairs aren't pulled out. People are looked down on. Children aren't born knowing that. They learn that. Jesus wants us to teach them a better way. Jesus wants us to know a better way. So he says, love God with all that you are, of course. But love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if that means getting down on your knees at a dinner and washing the feet of your disciples, he was perfectly prepared to do that and did. And I'll leave you with the words he said that night to Peter and the others who thought they were really something. They did. He said, and now go and do as I have done to your brother and I will add to your sister. For you, if you wish to be great in the kingdom, must first serve you must first serve those with whom you share this life. Humility? Absolutely. A humble heart? You bet. 
but we live in a time where such things are not looked upon as being a strength. We're often seen as a weakness. Who will you listen to? I ask myself that all the time. Will I listen to the world, to society, to the places where I get what little honor I get? Or will I listen to him? I choose him. Amen. Again, I would remind you, if you would, to look in your bulletin for those that we list as prayer concerns. We uh, try to keep that up for you as best we're able. And again, if you have any that you have as prayer requests, please do not hesitate. Email, text, call the office, fill out a card so that we know that. And again, let us know if this is something you would like publicly mentioned um, or not. Patty has one for us this morning, and it's prayers for Sarah, uh, their niece, in Florida, she has been taken off the kidney transplant list, no longer eligible, and has uh, dialysis uh, five times a week, if you can imagine that. When, able, uh, when, able, when she's able, she's not very well, so we want to keep Sarah in our prayers, and we will. Thank you, Patty. It's, um, there's always these kinds of stories in our lives, and I know you bring them, I do, of people that we know they are going through tough times, and, and, you know, we have a tendency to hide a lot. We really do. We, we think, oh, well, you know, everybody has their troubles. Well, they do. That's fact. But at the same time, when we share with another person what's in our hearts, when we say to somebody, you know, I'm scared, I'm worried, that is something that can truly help us a great deal. And when you pray together with somebody, that changes everything. You know, if you look at social media, and I do from time to time, you'll see prayer requests on there. I see several I get all the time, and you'll see some of the most horrible things, situations in life, and you wonder, how do they get through it? And then I'll notice sometimes down on the bottom, 10,000 people say they have liked it. In other words, they're, they're going praying, and that, and that gives people strength. It gives them a sense that people care and know that God cares. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be together. We enter into this season of Lent now, Lord, and it's a time where we're asked to, well, look a little at, uh, deeper at our own lives. How is it that we see others we live this life with? Do we see them as fellow uh, sojourners in life, brothers and sisters 
in some sense since we share this world together and we have a common creation? Do we look upon others as being uh, someone who we at least need to try to, to relate to? Or we just reject certain groups of people because they differ from us in politics or they live in a different country or they seem threatening. Help us to have open hearts, not foolish hearts, but open hearts to others. Help us to look upon them in their need and know that when we're called in our hearts to pray, we must do so. We, we must offer what's in our hearts if we do not, it's as if we are closing off a part of our who we are. We are open to you, God. Everything about us is open to you. And we pray that you will work with us and help us to grow in our faith and our strength. That as we look upon others, we first see a child of God. We first try to know who this child of God is before we make judgments. And yes, there are those out there we must be very careful around. We know that. But we cannot assume that's everyone. So bless us, God, with hope and peace in our hearts that we might live public lives that display and call upon others to see that it, you can live in peace. You can live with acceptance of others. You can live and still be a faithful person to what you believe, still faithful to the truths that Jesus Christ has taught. So we ask God that you bless us even now as we pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven. offer a uh, thanksgiving for the gifts given to the church. May we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much that people care and they give of themselves through acts of service, through words of concern and care, and through financial gifts to help people in need and to help in the mission of this church. We are a church that believes in mission we support those who try to support others who go out into places that we may not be able to go. And we offer our prayers, we offer our support, and oftentimes, as many do in this church, we offer service. So we thank you, God, for the opportunity to give back in this way. And we pray that you will bless not only our efforts, but the gifts we offer. Bless them with your grace so that they might reach those in need and that they might realize that they are cared for, they are loved by a God who loves them as you love us beyond all measure. All of this we pray and give our thanks for in Jesus' holy name, amen. Would you sing with me this response? And now may God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you, my friends. God's blessing is a beautiful thing. For God blesses us with hope. God blesses us with peace. For this is the grace of God. I merely speak these words. But it is God who blesses. So may God bless us all. May God show us the way. May God take this truth.
to Jesus Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn is, O Jesus, I have promised. <laughs>